Startup TV and our new series where we are featuring tech entrepreneurs from Africa. Today we have uh, Mr. Mawaki Chango, who is a PhD, strategist, writer, researcher, consultant and entrepreneur. He is the founder of DigiLessix, an entity with the mission to contribute to the use of ICT for social change including for the improvement of people's livelihood and prospects in life. So, Mawaki, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Go, okay, tell me, did you like it? Combine three components. Mm -hmm. One is an advisory firm, mm -hmm. another one is a research institute, and then you have also a social enterprise. Can you briefly tell me what each of those branches do? Well, uh in fact, DigiLexis basically is a consulting business, it's a, it's a consultancy. So, uh, but because I have this background of, uh, you know, uh, civil society participants, not to say advocates and activists, if you will, uh, regarding ICT policy and internet governance particularly, um, I, I still have that, uh, that um, drive to combine business and uh, social enterprise uh, aspect of things. So, and I'm a researcher, I'm also, as you said, I'm a PhD, so I'm interested in research and I want to keep it, uh, you know, to keep uh, one foot at least uh, in the research. Mm -hmm. So, with DigiLexis Consulting comes the project of having at some point a DigiLexis Institute, which will be a research institute of think tank of the sort. And uh, while doing that, I keep being engaged at, with civil society. And uh, uh, you know, I still, I kind of um, start being a little reluctant to be attacked <laughs> uh, civil society because I'm also a business person, right? So, but uh, the idea is that I come from Africa, and I know we we are facing a lot of challenges in Africa, and. Uh, we need to advocate for some um, uh, inclusive policies and, and that's why I participate in uh, civil society because we need to bring our policy makers to understand that it's not only about taxes and uh, monopolies but if they really want their communities, their nations to uh, leverage ICT to advance uh, as uh, even uh, as uh, you know uh, uh, I want to say on um, in terms of economy you know in terms of development but not just social development but well-being and uh, you know wealth etc they do need to to, to think through and uh, and uh, not to be short-sighted uh, not to maintain monopolies just for the sake of collecting taxes, but they, they really need to put in place some uh, um, uh, policies that are really um, well, uh, how would I say it? Some policies that, were, that are well thought out and uh, that fits the, uh, the bill, if you will. Okay, yeah. cool. So tell me, you are a researcher, you are a PhD, why have you decided to become an entrepreneur rather than working in a lab or in a government or something? Yeah, because, you know, uh, I guess that's something that uh, many entrepreneurs share, is that they have that vision. They want to bring something new, they want to do something relatively new, relatively in the sense that even if it's done somewhere else, it's not done in their community. And they think this can, you know, make a difference in their community. Even if it's a, a capital driven in terms of it's a, it's a for-profit business, but just to have someone who has done so far and done a lot of things and instead of staying there and doing, continue doing those things, come back and say, okay, we can, I know if I say to people, uh, you know, I'm a DigiLexus uh, and uh, I'm a CEO, DigiLexus, this is the business, so doing this and that, and where are you based? I'm based in Bombay to sound, you know, real, so, because they never heard about some, uh, 
interesting uh, enterprise in the digital you know, field coming from Lomé. If I say Accra, it's, it might be different, but if you say Lomé, okay, it will be surprising. But that's, that's the challenge. I, I wanted to make it possible for people to accept the idea that entities such as DigitalXs can come from Lomé you know, can, and can operate from uh, from the moment, but that's another challenge. Okay, so <laughs> tell me what excites you the most in Africa in tech on the tech aspect. What excites me the most is that it's um, it's a frontier still in Africa, in many parts of Africa, and there are interesting hap interesting things happening. Because of that, you know, frontier, that's, you know, we, we still have a lot to do, we still have, you know, almost everything to do. And when I watch scenes like uh, Nairobi in Kenya, or, uh, uh, you know, Cape Verde, and countries like that, I feel like, okay, you know, even people from the US, they start, you know, uh, be interested in those markets, you know. If you go to Kenya, for example, they are, you know, getting uh, their food there. They are people are raising funds. Or they are, you know, like uh, uh, capital venture stuff and uh, angel, angel investors are getting interested. And I think that's the new direction for us to take. And uh, those are the kind of things that get me interested. The, the, the vibrancy, the, the energy, the youth and being excited to also match up with the rest of the world. How exactly the internet community can help to lower the access, the access for example to internet, to internet cost in the developing countries? Is it something that the international community can do to lower those costs? Okay, um, there are at least two or three levels in that question. Uh, I think the origin of that remark was uh, at the uh, internet governance global level and the idea then was that you know all the fees or you know what you one need to pay to get in the internet market like uh, uh, to be a registrar for example a registrar is an entity where the end user can go and register the domain name the registry is another entity that operates the top level domain name like .org, .com, etc. Then there are registrar who can register end users in .com or in .org or in .net, etc. So the idea then was that those fees, because there are there are barriers, entry barriers at that level too. Uh, if you if you ask that you know it has to take four or five hundred thousand dollars to be able to apply for, to, to operate a, 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 a top level domain name as a registry, then you are eliminating a bunch of people coming from developing countries who might have the technical capacity and they, uh, they were be taught to do that, but because of the amount of money to pay, they can do that. So that was, uh, I think, the origin of, uh, you know, the first part of the remark. The other thing regarding internet access costs within our countries, uh, the way the international community can help is uh, at two levels. Um, you have entities such as uh, the World Wide Web Foundations doing research and advocacy around internet access. They, they want everybody to be able to have access to broadband, etc. What I regret with those actors is that they mainly, they, they, they mainly operate with uh, uh, English-speaking countries, European countries, and they forget the rest of us, they forget the front of the people, etc. So they are not very visible here. From here I cannot tell you they can do something. But if I were in Accra or uh, in Nigeria, I can tell you they can, you know, they have uh, the, uh, the former communication minister from Nigeria uh, with them as an advisor or something. So they, they go there, they, they, they hold meetings and they advocate, they show uh, the result of their research because those countries are including their, in their research. Generally, they collect data from those countries 
etc. So they can show the result of the exercise saying, you know, because of this situation, we are missing out something. You know, if you have a better policy, open to access, etc., etc., you could have this and that. Um, so that kind of research and advocacy can work. Can work. Um, the other way is that you know, is just campaigning, uh, advocating, and uh, and and uh, uh, you know, putting the putting those some of the bad practices in those countries uh, in the spotlight, and uh, hoping that the public scrutiny, uh, public discourse, and all that will help uh, develop the situation. Mm -hmm. Coming back to this French-speaking country, is it themselves who are self-excluding themselves, or is it the international community? Is it the language barrier, or what actually exactly is the problem? I would say the first thing well, is the language barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a de facto thing. It's a, it's a de facto barrier. So, of course, it's not something that cannot be overcome. But because it's de facto and uh, it's easy to, to, to just keep it that way or you know, to, to do nothing about it. And so we, we, are, we are still faced with that, that situation. But um, on the, in addition to that, I guess it's also easy for those organizations to work with people who they, with whom they can exchange spontaneously, quickly, and they understand, you know, each other, etc. So they don't, they don't work. because you know the francophone people, we francophone people, we do have a, a different uh, work ethic, uh, ethic, and uh, we, 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 we are not, we don't always respond as quickly as, you know, an American would like, for example, uh, or, or European for that matter. Uh, so, it will take a lot of effort, it will take additional effort for anyone willing to do that to, to get results out of it. So, yeah, for all of, all, because of all, of all of those hurdles, people just leave it as it is. Okay, cool. And we know that in Africa, at the moment, there are quite a lot of uh, problems to access internet. Mm -hmm. What do you think can be the most pressing action that the government or the institutions locally can mm -hmm. take to accelerate this internet access to the wider population? Here at home. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a straightforward uh, uh, answer to this, but on the other hand, it's a difficult uh, answer to get government to to adopt or to embrace. It is breaking down the monopolistic situations or the near near monopol monopoly situation. Um, because I, I I preface that by saying you know it's a difficult. Uh, it's a simple answer yet difficult because um, most of our governments heavily depend on their, their revenue, the tax revenue. And uh, they are reforming, for example, in Togo, they have recently reformed the, the tax revenue service to make sure everyone is paying tax, and uh, especially the companies and all that. So for them, to go now and tell them, you know, you don't need to be a telecom operator. You don't need to hold on to the, you know, the telecom incumbents. You need to open the markets and uh, welcome new actors, and which will dr drive down the, the cost uh, and and uh, automatically government revenue as as far as uh, the telecom sector is concerned. It's a difficult argument to make for them to, to take. So uh, we need, we need uh, deeper studies that shows, you know, uh, longitudinal, longitudinal studies, if you will, that shows over time, that shows like within, in, in five years time, in five year time, in 10 years, how 
by opening up the markets, by liberalizing the markets and uh, uh, encouraging uh, uh, competition. The many the different changes that can occur and the, their positive impact on the economy. So when you are dealing with governments who are not in themselves, they are not culturally uh, um, inclusive entities, they are not uh, liberal entities, they, they don't, liberalization is not something that belongs to their core. And they, they always think of uh, what they have as uh, um, a pie, you know, a piece of the pie that they need to protect. Uh, telling them to work to, to get uh, foreign companies to come and operate for them is like, uh, are, we, are we not losing something here? Like something that they will, they will lose for good, you know, like they are losing the country, basically. So I think what we, we are missing, at, at least one of the most critical pieces, is that we don't have a very well organized research program to really dig into those issues and, and uh, uh, dive into those issues and, and really make the points evidence-based that, you know, this is the price you are paying. Not only you are getting money, cash in the, in the you know, in the government uh, accounts, but this is the price we are paying as a, as, a, as, a, as a whole, as a society. And if instead you take this road, you're talking about a digital economy, this is where you, you're going to get the real digital economy. You know, someone needs to, to be able to make that point fearfully based on evidence and uh, we, we, are, we are lucky. You also strongly believe in entrepreneurial mindsets yeah. and um, for Africa, yeah. economic and social development, than the so-called public aid to development. Um, how this mindset can be developed in countries where people's idea of success is to go to university and work in an office? I think people, even here in, in Togo, they are changing because, you know, they, they can see clearly that government doesn't have uh, the solution for them in many cases. So um, we, they are, we are already used to people doing a master's and then going, uh, going off for, to work as a, as a taxi driver or as a you know, motor taxi, etc. We, we've heard about those stories. So, uh, I think they have had enough time to realize that the solution is not to 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 look for to look for handouts from governments or opportunity from governments. Even if in many cases for many people the solution is still to work in office, you know, with private sectors, etc. Now, because of the hardship of the situation, you know. You, you, that's what it takes some time to get people to start you know, thinking about new ways of making money and surviving and thriving, etc. So I think we do have people who, are, who can be good entrepreneurs. The problem is the social context. The problem is the incentives. We've heard about uh, policies that offer incentives for, you know, Low, low level businesses like with 30,000 friends, CFA friends, you know, helping a woman to start selling, you know, something. Uh, Around 30 pounds. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So that kind of thing. But that's good, I'm not criticizing that. But we need to, to, to span the whole spectrum of, you know, business that are possible, thinkable in the country. We need to realize that there are people who want to start a, 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 a let's put it this way, how much would that be? A ten thousand dollar business. Okay? And and it's lifestyle not, business. Yes. Lifestyle. And it's not just about the money, it's about also the, the, the incentives, the policy incentives, the the, the if the government show that 
they are aware of that and uh, they want to, to support that. They, they, they open up, uh, they open um, uh, Giche, uh, uh, you know, um, those shops, one-stop shop or whatever, um, to help specifically young people to do that. We have this ministry called Ministry of Digital Economy. I, I wake up every day asking myself, what do they mean by digital economy, given the situation in the country? So, do you have something for people, entrepreneurs who have uh, innovative ideas in terms of digital technology to help them grow and, uh, and take their idea, you know, uh, to the next level, etc.? Those are the kind of things we need. But if you don't have that, boy, you have people, you know, these young people, they have nothing. They, they, they don't have, they don't even have a bank account to begin with, but, but they are full of energy and ideas. If you show them, if you don't keep them away from what is possible universally, by and if you so if you help them to realize those possibilities by putting the right policy in place, by putting the right access policy in place so that they can see everything that is possible to see on the internet in terms of because they are already seeing the, the nasty stuff. Anyway, one way or the other, they get their way around this, they, they watch those things. Now, in terms of training, education, uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, idea and support and nurturing those ideas, etc., et there are resources also on the internet they don't have access to. It, and they don't even imagine it's possible because they never saw that. They have never seen it. So that, that, that's the problem. You can, you, you, no matter how much or uh, how uh, uh, you know, how strong is the youth in terms of imagination, energy and all that. If the collective doesn't put measures in place that shows that they want to help, they want to, they, they, first they are aware or they realize that there are those things, there are those ways of helping our youth to get, uh, to get ahead then those young people, they will feel like alone in their corner. We don't even have um, um, uh, an, an incubator, you know, at, uh, at night, I mean, of that size, that will be um, something that the, uh, most of the youth will, will there are, you know, yeah. some small... There is a small one, no wheeler, yeah. uh, no it's government a, uh, yeah. incubator. With, yeah. uh, you know, the, the power, the, the administrative support and all that behind it now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now uh, back to yourself mm -hmm. as uh, someone who has lived abroad for a long time and a member of the diaspora mm -hmm. and back only recently in mm -hmm. Togo, mm -hmm. what has been your experience, um, you know, starting a business in Togo and uh, operating here? Okay, I have to say formally I haven't started the business in Togo yet. Mm -hmm. Actually, I registered uh, this business in uh, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Abidjan, previously. And one of the reasons was that the uh, internet access in Togo was not reassuring. Mm. And you know, so let me uh, elaborate a little bit on these aspects. When business people come to a place and they want to do business in a, in a specific sector, like you know, digital economy kind of business, and they see you offering internet access at prohibitive rates. When I came, now I say they, they put new rates in place. But when I came to 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 hope to connect at two megabytes per second, you need to you needed to spend as much, nearly as much as a, a director salary, a director in the public administration salary. I was told the, you know, the basic uh, salary for a director uh, is uh, 200,000 uh, CFA. CFA. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the two megabyte uh, package was, uh, was, uh, was 173,000 something, so nearly 200,000. And the business person see that. The question, the obvious question is, who is going to consume my 
digital content. Who is going to, in this country, where the, 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 um, this, um, how do we say, the, um, the minimum wage is around 35,000, right? So that rate was like a, at least five times uh, the minimum wage. So who in this country is going to afford that access, that price to access and is going to be my client, my customer? The, the answer is clear for a business person. So that's not a country ready for digital economy, really. That, that's, that's a joke when we talk about digital economy. Um, so that was around the situation why I went to Abidjan first because you know the context is not right really for uh, digital enterprise. Uh, so so far to uh, come back to your question, I haven't registered yet. I'm here individually uh, talking to people, uh, you know, exploring the field. And, and uh, trying to check, you know, what are the issues and uh, who might be my, uh, you know, prospective clients, etc. And then at some point, maybe a month, two months from now, I'll decide to jump and, uh, and, and uh, go ahead and register the business here. Was it um, easy for you as a Togolese to register in Cote d'Ivoire? Is there West African integration um, a reality or was it also a bit of struggle if you are not a national from the country? No, I think it's just business reality. Whether it's come, it's come, it's come from a, a Western African uh, person or from Europe or from the US, uh, the process is, uh, is the same and uh, it's quite straightforward, so it's relatively easy. They have that um, one-stop shop too, and uh, and uh, so you can uh, get help and get your paperwork done uh, quite so quickly. Um, but what I noticed that is not on the positive positive side of, of things is that they too people are in that mood of digital enterprise and all that, you know, the young people and all that, but. The bureaucratic structure, they are not. The bureaucratic uh, uh, requirements, they are not at that level. The, the, the simple reason I'm saying that is this. Why they have that one-stop shop to facilitate things? The tax structure for a small startup, a digital startup, is just the same as the tax, tax structure of a, a car sales or uh, a, a, a someone selling parts and uh, a build, building uh, construction materials, etc. It's just the same structure. You start paying right away and uh, it's, it's the same. So I think they, they don't, uh, the administration doesn't get it yet. Uh, they need a, anyone, any country, any uh, uh, you know, state and country government, they need to understand that they to open up a space where a business that can be run from Accra or from Praia will come here instead of going to Accra or Praia. So you need tax incentives, you need to put something in place that really respond to that kind of uh, population, knowing, acknowledging their struggle and all that. It's an innovative thing, it's an entrepreneurial thing, it's a people coming up with new things, trying out stuff and it won't work right away, etc. So you need to come up with uh, measures and incentives that address those that population before we can really start talking about digital economy. Other than that, if you are taxing people just like, you know, one person having to do all the research uh, behind in order to put, you know, to come up with the services that he can offer and, uh, and to build a, a good website and say, I can do this, I can do that. The research, there's continuous research going on behind. Uh, for, like, for example, for a consultancy that is based in, on research, right? You are doing it constantly, you know, uh, uh, losing sleep over stuff, but you don't have a budget for R&D. Yet, if you ask the tax, uh, you know, the tax officer that, you know, can you 
can you pay yourself a, 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 an amount of money and register that as a charge because you've been doing R&D for your business? There's no such thing because the R&D all, all, all only uh, is only recognized for big structure that have a department of R&D, a division for R&D. And, and they have a budget for that, so they can say, okay, this budget is for R&D, so maybe we, we can have a tax break here, etc. But for the individual working day and night to do, you know, in order to build the content of his business, it's, the individual is doing some sort of R&D also, but you know, there's no way you can put that as a charge and uh, to have a break for, on it. Either you put it as a salary directly and you have tax as a salary, or you know, that's just ours you give away to your own business of course and we are willing to do that. But what I'm saying is the um, uh, administrative context still doesn't help very much. Do you think that in African countries are putting too much emphasis on FDIs rather than trying to develop something perhaps a little bit also or including some smaller scale? Uh, investment or encouraging entrepreneurs like people from the diaspora that can go from a country to another one who can also create riches in their country but they, they seem to be much more attracted to FDI, big investment coming from or they are encouraging FDIs. Do you think that there need to be something for smaller entrepreneurs as well? And you mean a, a foreign direct investment yes. by, by FDI? Okay, yeah. Uh, that is really, that's, uh, you know, I, I have no, <laughs> no hesitation once, uh, one second or whatsoever saying yes, of course, we are, that, that's the whole thing, that thing about creating a department in the government lab, labeled uh, um, digital economy and then really not doing really much about digital economy, but fostering or you know helping the digital economy to emerge digital entrepreneurs because there's no digital economy without digital entrepreneurs and if you having a uh, prohibitive uh, uh, cost for you know for access then you not there's no way no no way you can realize uh, uh, you know um, you you're not trying to even realize economy of, of scale you say okay uh, yeah, I, I put a lot of money in, into the infrastructure, so I have to, in order to get my money back, uh, for, you know, over two years, I have to uh, uh, to build these amounts, and then you don't give any consideration the actual economy of the country, how much people are paid, who can afford it, etc. So you don't really give any consideration to how many people can really access the thing. So on what will you build, build a digital economy. So that's, I think that's related to the fact that there's always that culture turn to foreign sources, you know. Those people, they can afford to pay that kind of rating, there's no problem. And generally, in fact, the only foreign entities that will want to get into our markets in terms of digital markets are the operators because they know they can compete very well with uh, the kind of rates we have with the incumbents and uh, still make money. And, uh, and generally they get their return on investment uh, about two years uh, and after getting into the market. That's it. Nobody else will come and say, oh, this is a digital environment, I can create uh, you know, a company, a startup, etc. So let me go there. People can go to Prior because Cape Verde, they have taken uh, uh, drastic measure. I mean, now the, the high speed, the broadband in Africa is in Cape Verde is like you know you are in the US or UK or you know you have more than you can use. So people can go there, but here or even Kodiwa, people will not come from far away to say I'm going to settle here to to do something digital because you know I have. A, uh, the infrastructure right here, etc. Et so, you know, they don't, we don't have that, we are not there yet. And we, the problem is for some of our country, we are not even taking in that direction. And 
you're right, they, they are putting uh, too much emphasis on uh, foreign uh, direct investments and, uh, and generally those investments are like, you know, in, in, in the, the ports, you know, the big businesses with a big trunk coming with big trunk trade and stuff like that. Yeah, those are traditional sectors of business and those are the sectors where the foreign actors, apart from, as I said uh, earlier, the operators, those are the businesses where you know, French big companies come to invest in because they, you know, they have a situation where their country assure them to have a quasi monopoly to, uh, in, uh, in some of those sectors, so and they get big money. Um, what I find regrettable is, is it, this is true in uh, you know, whatever sector, is that there is that culture beyond digital enterprise and uh, entrepreneurship. There's that culture that our uh, leadership, our decision makers, uh, they tend to um, value the contribution or they tend to just give consideration. It's like they act as if their nationals have no agency. They have no contribution to make. We are fearful people. We, we don't have that um, uh, drive to actually to, to, to take risk. I mean, people may have their entrepreneurial kind of thing, but really, on the risk side, we are, we are too measured. Contained. Someone, a Senegalese hotel, was telling me uh, the other day that what he noticed that in Togo, from all the other national you know, nationality he knows of, and he has been around, uh, you bring them a, a bag of one hundred thousand uh, dollar, for example, is to give them. They will take it and put it aside or behind, <laughs> and then ask you what what, what do you want, what uh, what is it about. But if you bring it to the Togolese, he will step back <laughs> and say, what is it? Why are you giving me this? <laughs> so that's how he described our, you know, that uh, aversion to risk. Uh, and uh, I think uh, he's true because uh, when you approach people, people seem to, to you know, take a you know, step back and look at you. Where does he come from? Uh, who is sending him? Who has been? Who has he been in touch with? So, uh, what would you advise uh, the people from the diaspora who want to get involved in tech in Africa? Uh, well, they, they need to make sure that the scene is well, uh, you know, prepared. And uh, the good news is that so they can contribute to preparing the scene from wherever they are. They don't need to be necessarily on the scene itself to get it uh, clear. Uh, so, the kind of thing they could do is to, to get together to have a voice in terms of if they are interested in digital uh, entrepreneurship and uh, uh, you know whether it's social entrepreneurship or doing business online etc uh, they need to make sure to let the policymaker understand that part of the equation today is that to have a good a clear a, a predictable uh, regulatory framework uh, regarding those things. And it, not only a clear and predictable reg regulatory framework, but a framework that shows that it's the, the, the designer of the framework understand the opportunity of digital economy or digital entrepreneurship. So they need to get at least some kind of advocacy so that the um, policymakers understand that if they want those people to invest back in their country or to return and do business in their country, part of one critical part of the equation is to get to have a good infrastructure, a good uh, uh, access, and a good regulatory framework. Uh, which are the other or um, some opportunities that you see for businesses from abroad to be involved in Tech Africa Revolution? Well, one obvious venue for me that I can uh, indicate here is, you know, um, getting into um, funding startups, you know, looking, looking for 
the peoples, the young people, the younger ones who are uh, uh, bubbling with ideas, with uh, innovative ideas, to first let them know that there are people out there who are willing to put money in the, in, in the business, to um, participate in the business, to take a share or some, some kind of partnership on the business in terms of injecting cash so that because what what one of the things that's really characteristic here is that people may have ideas but they don't have the resources they don't have you know uh, the, the, the financial uh, resources that will help them to 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 get their their business off the ground and sometimes they don't even have management skills so people from uh, overseas who may have management skill may, may volunteer to help the younger one struggling here with management to help them manage their stuff or the other people who don't have time but they have some money to organize it's not about coming and giving your money in, a, in a, any way uh, to organize if it's a trust in funds or some kind of uh, capital scheme and have a, a structure around it where the younger people can come with their application ideas and submit. You know, it's just like uh, pitching their ideas to a venture or to an angel uh, capitalist to to get them to you know to convince them to that the, the idea is good, is promising, that they can invest in, in it. So we can have people from overseas uh, diaspora forming our a set of uh, um, venture capitalists or uh, angel investors. But just to conclude, I would say we still have a long way to go. We really need all hands on deck. We need people, you know, the problem is uh, People are not uh, always willing to speak a lot uh, within the country. So we need, we really need diaspora. We need, we need people to get organized out there and start saying to the government, to the policymakers, we need to do better. We need to do better. The internet revolution has been around for long now. You know, for a revolution, you know, no revolution has lasted ten years like that in history, um, at least not te technological or technical revolution. So we've been into this for, for some time now. We understand that it's, it is here to stay. It's the new deal. It's, uh, you know, digital transformation, digital revolution is something we have to live with and to live by. So we need people, um, clear voices with clear voices, to tell government, to tell any decision maker, any it can be the manager of Togo Telecom, Togo Star, whatever. All those people who have a decision making power you know, regarding our position on the map, regarding uh, you know, as, as far as internet or digital, the digital revolution is concerned, they need to hear those voices, those clear voices, those well educated, well informed, well prepared voices. They, we are waiting for Togo, for the country to get uh, on board, to get um, to step up and offer to the citizens of this country the platform where they can really show and compete with uh, others in the world what they are able. Okay. Oh, you clearly made your voice heard. Uh, <laughs> how can people get in contact with you? Well. Um, they can get in contact with me uh, by checking my website, which is not finished. But I think there's a, a info contact on the website. It's uh, www.digilexus.com. Otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm well present on the discussion with uh, in internet governance. Okay, thank you very much, Marky, for yeah. having uh, this conversation. Thank you, thank you for coming uh, around here to tease us a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, Mawaki and I would love to hear from you and know what was your key takeaway from this conversation. Please leave your message below. And for more information, you can go on my website, which is fossilbelay.com. 
or follow me on Twitter, which is at Fonsin Billy. 